So the title of this sermon today, this morning, is When Evil Persists, Christ Prevails. When Evil Persists, Christ Prevails. Because when horrible, evil things happen, Christ is never overcome. His plan and purpose shines through the darkness, and it cannot overcome the kingdom that he has established here on earth. And we'll see from the, our text today that even in his own grief, his own emotional torment, Christ is more concerned with a crowd of people than he is in processing his own emotions or grieving. The ministry needs of others does not stop because Jesus or you or myself maybe might be going through a personal hard time. Jesus is grieving here, and we'll see in this text, he's grieving the loss of his friend and cousin, John the Baptist. But yet he doesn't turn away from others in his pain. So yeah, that's right. We're back in Matthew. Uh, we've taken a little bit of a break from Matthew. I think this is now our third time jumping back into the Gospel of Matthew. Um, and it's, it's really, really exciting. I love the Gospel of Matthew because of how often Matthew connects back to the Old Testament. Matthew, he was a Jewish t- tax collector whom Jesus had called to be a disciple. And so Matthew's primary audience throughout his gospel is, is a Jewish audience. And so he's bringing prophecies and fulfillments from the Old Testament into and showing that how Jesus fulfills that, how Jesus uh, accomplishes these prophecies and these from, from the Old Testament. And so his goal through his gospel is to show his Jewish brothers and sisters is that Jesus fits the bill when it comes to being Messiah. And so before we dive into that too much, I want to go over where we've been the past 13 chapters of Matthew. Matthew opens up his gospel account with Jesus' genealogy, and this is a part of the Bible that many of us just skip over, but he's showing that from Jesus' lineage, from his lineage, that he is son of David, and that he was born of a virgin, and he did not inherit the sinful nature of his father, Adam. And then we see throughout Matthew, going moving forward, John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, had been ministering ahead of him, proclaiming Matthew 3, 2, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John baptized Jesus, and the Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove, and he rested on Jesus. And the Father spoke, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this was done in front of a crowd. Others saw the skies open, and Christ proclaimed as the Messiah. Then Jesus goes into the wilderness where he's tempted by Satan. He becomes a target of so many attacks, yet the devil flees in his presence. And Jesus begins his ministry thereafter. He calls disciples. He, he gives great teachings in the Sermon on the Mount, which, which brings a greater insight into what the New Testament was saying all along. People listening to the sermon couldn't help but notice afterwards, Matthew 7, 28, 29 says, when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who has authority and not as their scribes. So Jesus was different. And after the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus continues his ministry. He he heals, he calms storms, showing that he has authority both over creation, over the wind and the waves, and he has authority over the diseases that plague mankind. Matthew draws all of this out to show and try to persuade his Jewish brothers and sisters that indeed Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one we've been looking for. He teaches, Christ teaches in parables that the common man can understand because it is the lowliest that have a place in his kingdom. And just before our text today, Jesus returns home only to be rejected by those he knew best, his friends and his family. Matthew 13, 57 says, a prophet This is Jesus' words here. A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and his own household. And so because of their unbelief, Jesus decides not to perform miracles there. But in our text today, 
this crowd believes in Jesus' power and believes in the miracles that he has performed. And so with that, if I should read along with me, Matthew 14, 1 through 21. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus and said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Heroditus, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to be put to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Heroditus danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it. And they went and told Jesus. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went to shore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the village and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they ate, they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides the women and the children. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you this morning, Lord, and we just ask for your blessing, Lord, that you would speak to us and that you would give us the ears and the hearts to hear your word, to hear what you would have us to hear. Lord, put away all distractions from our minds, Lord, and help us to to hear from you, Lord, to worship you through the preaching of your word. Lord, I ask that you would set me aside, Lord, that we might just hear from you for your glory and our joy. Amen. So, verses 1 and 2, again, read, At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead, and that is why these miraculous powers are at work within him. So Herod, the Tetrarch, is the son of Herod the Great, who in Matthew 2 ordered the murder of baby boys to try to eliminate Jesus. All right, so this Herod, he doesn't come from the greatest stock. And he doesn't prove to be much better either. In Acts, we read about his persecution of the church, Acts 4.27 For truly in the city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. And again we read about Herod in Acts 12, 1 through 3. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. So Herod the Tetrarch is the son of a murderer. And he also has the blood of the church on his hands. That is not all, though. He he's shows that he's suspicious of Jesus. He thinks that Jesus is the resurrected John the Baptist. And that's the reason why all these miracles and powers have been happening through Jesus' ministry. And that tells us that John the Baptist is dead. So then more blood is on Herod's hands. It's John the Baptist's blood. So let's read about it, verses 3 through 12. 
For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Heroditus, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to them, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Heroditus danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever, whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry, but because of his oath and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it. And they went and told Jesus. So John the Baptist had spoken up against Herod and his sick incestual marriage. Herod took his brother Philip's wife. But Heroditus was the daughter of Astrobulus, who is Herod and Philip's other brother. So Heroditus is their niece. So Heroditus is their niece. First off, marries Philip. Then Herod, the Tetrarch, demands that they get divorced so that he could marry his niece. Fun, isn't it? And this makes sense why John the Baptist rails so hard against Herod. That he would speak out against such sinful behavior being openly displayed in their leadership, in their authority. And so then um, John the Baptist refers to a a Levitical law, which reads, Leviticus 18, 16 says, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. And so John the Baptist was put in prison for holding the authority uh, accountable to Levitical law. But many people had come to have a favorable view of John the Baptist, believing that he was a prophet. And for this reason, to not incite a possible riot or anger the people, Herod didn't really feel that it was the best decision to execute John on the spot. So imprisonment would do. But this was not the attitude of Heroditus. She wished for further punishment for John the Baptist. So she persuaded her daughter, and this is daughter from the first marriage to Philip. She asked her to ask for John the Baptist's head. When she danced and pleased Herod and the guests. And in Christian art depicting this scene, Heroditus is normally depicted as a, a seducer, um, seducing Herod and his guest. But we don't really know what it was about the dancing that they really enjoyed, that they, they really liked. But whatever it was, they enjoyed the dancing enough to give her whatever it was that she asked for. And that would be John the Baptist's head. And not wanting to be potentially embarrassed by going back on his word in front of all of his guests, Herod fulfills the request, and John the Baptist's head is delivered on a silver platter. And the disciples buried his body, And then went to tell Jesus the news. Verse 13. Now when Jesus had heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. I always find Jesus' expressions of grief interesting. Jesus experienced a fully human life while he was here on earth with with its fully human trials, grief included. Though he was God, he did not use his divine privileges as God to avoid grief, to to protect the ones that he loved from suffering and pain. Because of this, Christ can then empathize with us in our grief, in our loss, in our pain, in our suffering, because he himself has suffered. And so, feeling this pain, his first cousin, who he has known from childhood, his first cousin is beheaded in a gruesome, gruesome matter. And so Christ leaves, gets on a boat, he goes to a desolate place, he goes to the desert 
to grieve. But because of Jesus' fame, this same fame that Herod was so worried about, making him think that he was John the Baptist reincarnated, because of this fame, the crowds hear where Jesus is going and they follow him. And they go out to this desolate place where Jesus is. Jesus can't even get alone to mourn. Think back to a time when you've experienced great grief. If you have, how did you process it? How did you go through it? Is there something reflecting back that you wish that you had done differently? Or something that you, would have, you know now or believe now that would have helped you in that moment? I think we can take a note from Jesus here in his grief. I think often in our grief, in our suffering, a lot of us have a tendency to put on a tough face. I know in my own grief that I've tried to get to the healing part where I'm okay in front of people before I was ready to actually go there. But here we see Jesus withdraws by himself. He withdraws to seek the Father. And I think it's important that we we take note of that and we also give ourselves that space when we experience grief and suffering, that we withdraw as well and seek our Father. Jesus exemplified this practice often. Silence and solitude are necessary disciplines of the Christian life. Especially when we're going through our own emotional distress. But yet if I were in Jesus' situation here, where I go to practice this silence and solitude, where I go to, to, to grieve only then to be met with a crowd, I think that would have bothered me. I think I would have been a little upset. I would have been frustrated. I, w- I would have wanted that time alone, but this is not Jesus' reaction. Verse 14, when he went to shore and saw a great crowd, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Jesus, in the midst of losing John the Baptist, he sees this crowd which has followed him and he has compassion on them. He sees their sick. Even though he's going through suffering, he sees their suffering and still feels for them. His heart still breaks for these people. And so he has compassion on these people and he heals their sick. He ministers to them through his own pain, through his own suffering, through his own grief. This is what a good shepherd looks like. And this is how Isaiah prophesied Jesus, whom he called the wonderful counselor, would be. Isaiah 40, 11 says, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Let's imagine this picture with me. Jesus, remember, he's a carpenter. He's got rough hands. He's, he's probably burly, probably in pretty good shape, right? A man's man. And he picks up these little lambs as a good shepherd and he holds them tight to his chest and he cares for them. He protects them. He provides for them. He leads them gently. And what, does, what do these lambs, what do the sheep give back to Jesus? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. This is just Jesus pouring out of himself his generous kindness and love as he cares for these sheep. He approaches the crowd as a good shepherd even when his own personal grief is weighing on him. The crowd sees Jesus and Jesus, the the wonderful counselor, the good, gentle, kind shepherd, takes them in his arms. He heals their sick. He serves them. Though he intends to go and process his own grief, he can't help but to serve when he sees needy people. He doesn't take a self-care day, though Don't get me wrong, it's important to take self-care days. For us, we are limited. We are not Jesus, okay? So it's important for us to take self-care days to realign ourselves, right? Not railing against that. But but Jesus doesn't take one. He doesn't take one. He, He serves and he continues to pour out even in his suffering and his pain. 
He pours out. He is the well that never runs dry like he told the woman at the well. He has more to give and he gives out more and more and more. Although we Christians don't have the same supernatural capacity as Christ, we're far from perfect. I think oftentimes these same demands are placed on us. No matter if we're working in full-time ministry, no matter if we are a lay person, we're all involved in the ministry. We're all involved in the kingdom of God. And so these same demands of self-sacrifice and of giving are placed on us, even when it doesn't really align with our personal schedules necessarily. The kingdom is one of service and self-sacrifice and of counting others as greater than ourselves. Though the crowds are healed, the crowds are sticking around, they're staying with Jesus, and the disciples acutely observe they don't have enough food to feed all these people, right? So let's read, read about this in verses 15 through 21. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, we're in a desert here, and the day is over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. But they said to him, we have only five loaves and two fish. He said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up the 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So the disciples here see a real and uh, practical issue. They don't have enough food to feed everyone. The text says that there was 5,000 men, not including women and children. They guessed there was probably 20,000 people there. Five loaves of bread, two fish. Math doesn't really uh, check out, right? So disciples are right in saying, what are we feeding them with? (laughs) What are we going to feed them with? But Jesus says to the disciples, be just fine. We will be just fine. If I were in the disciples' shoes, I don't know about you guys. Maybe you're you trust the Lord better than I do at times, but I would have looked at the five loaves and the two fish and be like, um, it seems like a problem, Jesus. <laughs> this seems like maybe this wouldn't stretch as far as we need it to for 20,000 people. I would have been hesitant. Yet, they distribute. They, they, they obey Christ and they distribute the, the food to the crowd of people. It's five loaves, two fish, 12 baskets, and these numbers may just seem like that, numbers, but the numbers five and 12 are very important, very important to Jewish people. And this miracle took place near Bethsaida, near the Sea of Galilee. This is a Jewish area. These are most likely Jews that he is ministering to here. So these numbers aren't arbitrary. They are communicating something. So the five books, five is the number of the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's the same number as the first five books. They're called the Torah. And these 12 baskets are representative of the 12 tribes of Israel. So in this miracle, Jesus is providing for them five loaves of bread, the same number as the Torah, communicating that he is now their sustenance. He is now provided for them. As the law was once their sustenance, Christ is now their sustenance, right? And he's offering them in 12 baskets, saying it's sufficient for all of Israel. I am sufficient for all of Israel. This is the, he is the completion of the law. And so not only is the miracle in and of itself great for this much food to be spread so far through so many people, but there's symbolism. Jesus is communicating something greater to these people. I am sufficient for Israel. This is something that Matthew's Jewish audience could have 
very much picked up on, being familiar with the importance of these two numbers. And what makes this cooler, I think, is in the next chapter, Jesus performs the same miracle by feeding 4,000 people in the area of the Gerasenes, which is filled with Gentiles. And it's filled with seven baskets with seven loaves of bread. And seven is the number of completion, bringing to completion Christ's ministry to Gentiles. And it's totally like Jesus to structure these two miracles in this way. It goes right along with his words in Matthew 15, where he says, I have come for the lost sheep of Israel, only then to heal the Canaanite Gentile woman. He, multi- he, he, he multiplies the loaves and does his miracle for the Jews, and then soon after does it for the Gentiles. Jesus came for the lost sheep of Israel, and this is why the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 in the, in the Jewish area happens first. But he is extending his ministry to the world. And that's what we'll see in the coming weeks. But there's something else about this miracle that could have clued Matthew's Jesus, Jewish audience into Jesus' Messiahship. And that is his connection to Elisha, the prophet. So read 2 Kings 4, 42 through 44 with me. A man came from Baal, Shalisha, bringing the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And Elisha said, give to the men that they might eat. But a servant said, how can I set this before a hundred men? Sound familiar? So he repeated, give them to the men that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall have eaten, they shall eat and have some left. So he set it before them, and they ate and had some left, according to the word of God. So God performed this very same miracle thousands of years before with Elisha. The Jewish readers might have recognized this connection and seen this as more so as evidence that Jesus is the one, that Jesus is the Messiah. Just as the loaves and the food was multiplied with Elisha, Jesus did the same. But Elisha, as a type of Christ we see in the Old Testament, it doesn't end there with his connection. Next week, we'll see Jesus walk on water, right? In 2 Kings 6, 6, Elijah makes an axe head float on water. He defies gravity and makes it float on top of the water. So 2 Kings 6, 6 says, then the man of God said, where did it fall? It being the axe head. And when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. And Elisha's dead body even gave life to a dead man. 2 Kings 13, 20 through 21 says, And as a man was being buried, behold, a marauding band was seen, and the man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. So the dead man was thrown into Elisha's grave and then came to life. And in a similar way, by Jesus' death, those who come to him are also born again into new life. Jesus breathes, through his spirit breathes, life into dead bones. So Matthew could have been pointing towards the same miracles that Elisha had performed and then cluing his Jewish audience in on the fact that Jesus is different, that Jesus is the one, that he is the one that we've been looking for, that he is the one we've been waiting for. And we've said it before, but I ought to say it again. Matthew's goal is to show that by the life and the teachings and the death of Jesus, that he is the Messiah. That Jesus was born of a virgin. He performed miracles that were long foretold in the scriptures. That he healed the sick, raised the dead, and gave sight to the blind. And that he would die. The Messiah's sacrificial death was prophesied long before Matthew ever put pen to paper. This death would be offered as a perfect sacrifice which would appease the wrath of God towards the sin of any who would believe, towards any who would repent and turn away and profess Christ as Lord and their Savior and King. He is a king worthy to serve above any other. He is the good shepherd, the wonderful counselor, the prince of peace. And so if 
you're here today and you are on the fence, whether you believe that this is Christ, I just encourage you, I would encourage you to, to look at the evidence. Look at Jesus' life. Look at the prophecies that he fulfilled. Look at the facts. The facts point towards it that Jesus is the Son of God. Coming to faith, believing is not separate from your intellect. It's not, it's, it's, it, it encompasses your intellect. It encompasses thinking hard about this, at looking at the facts, looking at the, the life that Jesus presents that he lived and that, that Matthew presents in his, in his gospel. And I urge you that if you look at this with an open mind, with an open mind, I believe that you will see the truth that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah. He is the one who was put up on a cross for your sins if only you would repent, you would apologize, you would turn away from your sin, and you would believe. So I urge you today to do that, to, to go to God, to, to repent, to turn from your sin, and to believe, to place your hope and your trust in Christ for your salvation. And then to come back next week, and then to be baptized. To then, to then proclaim to this, this whole church to proclaim to, to your brothers and sisters in Christ that you are born again, that you have risen out of your grave, that you are no longer dry, dead bones, but you have new life breathed into you, that you have the Spirit of God living in you, living and active in you. Make that profession to us and let us celebrate with you. Let us join with you in the celebration of the work of God. Let, him, let us praise him and worship him for what he is doing in your life. We won't know about it unless you come be baptized. So please don't rob us of that, of the opportunity to praise God and worship our Father for what he's done. So I urge you again, believe in Christ today and come and be baptized. Because we see from our text today that we have a God who brings beauty out of the ashes after John the Baptist is beheaded, beheaded he does not, Jesus does not lead a revolt against the authorities. He does not seek revenge, but he offers compassion and he ministers towards the crowds. Even in his pain, Christ gives abundantly. God never leaves evil with the last word. He does not, he does not leave John's beheading as the last and final word on that, but we know from Genesis 50, 20 that what is meant for evil, God intends for good. In the kingdom of God, evil is not left with the final word. And though Jesus seeks solace in, in his grief, he's, when he's met with the needy crowd, the demands of ministry are on him and, his, and the, the, his heart, his compassionate shepherd heart is for the people. And so he gives. He gives to them. He heals their sick. Jesus' kindness is evident. And we see that even in the darkest times, even in Jesus' darkest times, the death of his cousin and friend, he still ministers. He still is for others. He's for his people. And this is how we see Jesus live his entire life, even unto death. That on the cross, Jesus is the perfect example of what true self-sacrifice looks like. That he would die a horrible death, yet he is resurrected now and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And so for us today here, we can take confidence. We can take confidence and hope knowing that no matter what situation you're going through this morning, no matter the, the pain or the grief that we have a God who shines through the darkness. No matter the loss, the sickness, the suffering that you have here today, that we serve a Lord 
who has compassion. We serve a kind shepherd who gives of himself and he gives and he gives and he gives and it's never ending. Because he loves you. He loves you so much that he would die for you. God brings good from the bad. And this shows the supernatural compassion and love shows that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, that he is the hope and savior of our world. To him be glory and power forever. Amen. Let's pray.